This episode of Outlines contains descriptions of crimes against children and may not be suitable for all listeners, so, as always, discretion is advised. Welcome to the second part of my look into the murders in Beenham, Berkshire, which occurred between October 1966 and April 1967. If you haven't listened to the first episode, make sure you go back and do so before starting this one. Last week, Gemma and I visited the village of Beenham. Somehow, it's been three years since the two of us went to a location together. Those of you who have been listening to Outlines for a while will know that we used to share every drive, but for others of you, you might not even know that Gemma exists at all. The day we choose to go, we start at Gemma's house in Suffolk. The weather is mild and sunny, but by the time we've navigated the M25 and M4, it's changed dramatically. The last part of our journey is done through driving rain. We're in Gemma's van. It's not the one we used to use, but larger with the back kitted out for overnight stays. She tells me before we go, the van is best on motorways, but it's awkward on small country lanes. So, as we crawl up the hills which lead into Beenham, with the rain lashing the windscreen, we hope desperately that we don't meet anyone coming in the other direction. Gemma lives in the heart of the Suffolk countryside. She's well used to single file lanes, but in this area of Berkshire, not even the passing places are wide enough for two large vehicles to cross paths. We arrive at lunchtime, slowly cruising the narrow roads to find a place to stop and eat. We pass the Six Bells pub, the location where Yolandi Waddington was last seen alive, and end up in the small car park outside the Victory Hall, where in 1966 every man in Beenham had his blood taken in an attempt to find a match to her killer. I often say that there's no way to really know what a place is like without visiting there yourself, and the village of Beenham is a perfect example of this. In the past month, I've spent a long time walking virtually around the area on Google Street View, and equally as long pinpointing locations on old Ordnance Survey maps. By the time we arrive, I think I have a good idea of what to expect except that I don't, because no amount of wide-angled street view lens shots can prepare you for the narrowness of the roads and the sense of claustrophobia that being in Beenham brings. I don't know if it's the size of the van or the way the houses in the centre of the village hug the line of the road, but despite the old picturesque Berkshire buildings and expanses of countryside, I find myself feeling as if we're somehow too large for the place. As with many of the smaller communities we've visited, there is a sense that we shouldn't hang around too long. In 1967, the year in which today's case takes place, Beenham was described in the papers as a little country village, one where people are born and grow up and become old. Another said, It is a village of friends and relatives. Strangers stand out like telegraph poles in a meadow. One man, who had married into a well-known village family, summed it up by saying, You have to die here before anyone accepts you. Back then it was a secluded area, but one which was starting to feel the effects of urban sprawl. Between the farm cottages and fields, new dwellings were beginning to appear. It was reported that 90% of the men in the village worked in the factories that ran along the A4, or the Bath Road, as articles often referred to it. There was already a small estate of council houses, and more were emerging. And yet, despite that, by modern standards, Beenham is still a rural community. Before we go on the drive, I speak to a friend who's also written about the Beenham murders, And he says, I think the place where the girls were killed has been redeveloped now, except that it hasn't. 
What was once the May Ridge pit is now just a stretch of fields. And the area opposite, on the other side of the road, were the disused Blake's gravel pits, in which the bodies of nine-year-olds Jeanette Wigmore and Jacqueline Williams were discovered, may have been filled in, but what stands there now is still very much the same countryside as would have been there then. If you look at a map from the time, you see how Webb's Lane winds out of Beenham to where it intersects with Admore Lane. Marked along the road are a series of buildings, copses and pits. There are Park and Lambdon's farms, and Good Boys, Summer House and Deadwood Cops, among others. All the area is gravel pit and farmland and woods with snaking narrow tracks, which still follow the same footprint now as they did back then. The place where we stop, close to the site of the old gravel pit, is under a canopy of trees, but still provides little shelter from the rain, which refuses to hold off. Gemma and I, both underdressed for the weather, take it in turns to hurry from the van to snap a few photos, trying, unsuccessfully, to avoid the rabbit burrows which lurk below the vegetation, and quickly returning again to dry off. Sometimes location drives are like this. You travel a hundred miles to huddle cold and damp in a van by the side of a tiny country road in a county that you've only ever passed through on your way elsewhere. That day, I was worried I wasn't going to get a proper sense of the place, and yet there was one moment. I stood next to the van and just for a couple of minutes, the rain held off. And in that brief window, a silence fell on the area. I could hear the drip of raindrops rolling off of the trees, the wind in the foliage as it carried across the fields, and briefly I felt indescribably lonely. That was the moment in which I thought of the pits as they were then, and that evening, April the 17th, 1967, when the whole area was illuminated through the darkness by arc lights and by the headlights of emergency vehicles, as residents and police alike searched what would soon become a desolate landscape, as they looked for a body, looked for anything which would lead them to the man who killed Jeanette Wigmore and Jacqueline Williams. I'm Jess Carter, and this is The Outlines Podcast. the 17th of April started much the same as any other day for nine-year-olds Jeanette and Jacqueline, who were often described as pretty, lovely and full of life. Both of the children attended the village primary school, a single-storey building with only three classrooms. The girls were in the upper junior class. Jeanette, who had recently decided to cut her long blonde hair short, was described as being good at her schoolwork, with an ambition to be an air hostess. Her father, Tony, was a paper mill worker, and she had attended the school since she was an infant. Jacqueline for less time. Jeanette's family had been in the village for around six years. Tony Wigmore had reportedly been evacuated there during the war, and returned as soon as he could. Jacqueline's parents... Pamela and Terence, who owned Beenham Garage, had moved to the village in around 1964. Until January of 1965, she had attended Birch Copse Primary School in Tilehurst, and the headmistress there remembered that she was a very quiet, pleasant girl and nice-looking. She was quite bright at her work. 
That day, the two friends, who were described by the school's headmaster as not the sort of girls who made enemies, just friends, you could not help but like them, spent their last few school hours preparing logbooks for a youth hosteling trip. After finishing school, it was reported in the papers that Jeanette, a chatty and lively girl, went to visit her grandmother Alice, who lived at the top of Webb's Lane. Alice had been unwell, and the girl stayed for a little while, telling her, Goodbye, Granny. See you tomorrow day, when she went. Between the time that the girls left school and 4.30 that afternoon, is a little difficult to pin down an exact timeline, but we know that at around 4.30, the two of them left the Williams garage. Sometimes, Jacqueline's younger sister, six-year-old Caroline, would accompany them, but that day she decided against it, and so it was just Jeanette and Jacqueline who walked up Webb's Lane to Park Farm Cottages, where the Wigmores lived. Jacqueline pushed her bicycle alongside her, and they stopped to pick up Jeanette's, which her family had clubbed together to buy her as an eighth birthday gift. Then the two girls rode off in the general direction of the disused gravel pits. At around ten past five p.m., Jeanette's father, Tony, was watching from either the bedroom or the back room of their cottage when he saw the girls playing together on a track named Switchbacks, a few fields away from the house. Roughly 20 minutes later, Mr Goody and two small cousins, one of whom was a schoolmate of the girls, spied them at the junction of Webb's Lane and Admore Lane, where they were wheeling their bikes not far from Blake's gravel pit. The pit had been used by a local man until around 18 months prior, but now it was abandoned, and its main purpose seems to have become an area of interest for kids. It had swamps and dirt mounds, and not long prior, Jeanette had been at the pit collecting frog spawn from one of the pools there. Over the road at the Mayridge pits, the workmen began to think about heading home for the evening. It was a warm and still bright April day, and this sighting was the last time that the two girls were seen alive. It was a little while later that Tony and Marion Wigmore began to become concerned that their daughter was yet to return home. By the time it reached 6.45pm, Tony was worried enough that he started up his car, a white Hillman Husky, and headed out into the evening. His first stop was at the Williams to check that the children hadn't gone there, but the family had seen no sign of them, and so he continued to drive around the area looking for them. Eventually, he remembered the pit, and that Jeanette had told him only a few days before about finding the frog spawn there, and so he drove over to Blake's, parked his car on the access road, and continued his search on foot. Later, when the case against the man responsible for the girl's murder came to trial, Tony Wigmore, who wore a black armband throughout proceedings, took the stand as a witness to tell the courts what had happened that night. He said, I have no idea what time it was when I arrived at the pit. It was between dark and light, getting dusk. He remembered that he walked around searching, and after a while, he went to the centre of the pit, where a tin hut still stood on top of a mound. He said, I thought they might be playing in that. They weren't. I turned around and saw the cycles. From the bikes, he turned again, and it was then that he saw Jeanette at the bottom of the bank. She was lying shoeless and full length, face down in a shallow swamp-like pool. Tony waded into the pool and picked her up. As he lifted her, she started to bleed, but he carried her in his arms to a nearby telegraph pole, where he laid her carefully on the grass and went to fetch help. The time was around 8.30pm. Not long before this, the Williams family were growing increasingly concerned. 
Carol Kramer, who lived opposite their garage, recalled, Mrs Williams asked us if we had seen Jackie, as she had not been home since four. Mrs Williams was getting panicky, and my husband went to search for the girls with Mr Williams and the other villagers. The landlord of the Stocks pub, which stood on Webb Road, recalled that at some point that evening, Terry Williams walked in. He told the crowded room that Jeanette was dead and that his daughter was missing. The regulars put down their drinks, collected torches and boots, and headed out into the night to help the police, who had by that point arrived at the gravel pit. By arc light and vehicle headlights, the area which was now cordoned off was searched. At around 9pm, laying near the pool where she had been discovered, police found Jeanette's shoes, but still there was no sign of Jacqueline. Desperate for as many men as possible to help with their search, police called in over 50 villagers to assist them. At the six bells, news of the discovery of a body had spread indoors, and there was talk of the men going to join the search. Tom Cooper of Park Farm told the papers that police sent two men to call out every male villager from houses and pubs. Some were quick to join in the search, others stayed to finish their drinks. By closing time, those who made it up late to the scene were no longer required. Back at the pit, it had been a couple of hours since the discovery of Jeanette's body, but the darkness had slowed efforts and there was still no sign of Jacqueline. One of the police officers on the scene was Inspector Kenneth Much of Reading Borough Police. He would later tell the courts that he started his search at the gravel pits at around 10.45pm. I went to a pool about eight feet in diameter and waded in. The pool was about 12 inches deep in the centre, and it was filled with leaves, twigs and decaying vegetable matter of various kinds. As I waded into the water, I found an obstruction with my foot. I bent down and moved leaves and twigs to one side, and found a girl child. She was completely concealed. I lifted her head up and saw that life had gone, and I left things as they were until senior officers arrived. It was around 10.55pm, just ten minutes after he'd started his search. There are slightly differing reports on how far away from each other the two girls were found, but they average out at somewhere between 100 to 120 yards. Despite many officers already being in the area around the pool where she was discovered, Jacqueline's body had been completely concealed by leaves, twigs and rotting vegetation. Tom Cooper said later, The gravel pit is a 100% place for a murder. He could not have chosen a better place. It's absolutely desolate. By the next morning, news of the murders had reached the nationwide press. It had only been a few days since the inquest into Yolandi's death had been concluded, but if the villagers thought that her case had drawn attention onto the small village, it was nothing compared to what was to come. The papers described how, after dropping their kids at school, women stood close to tears in groups in the village street. One woman said, After Yolandi Waddington was found, we were warned this might happen again. We have not been allowing our children out at nights, but since the evenings have got lighter and our memories longer, we have let our children play in the light summer evenings. We just cannot believe that something like this could have happened again. Now we all walk in fear. We are locking our homes at night and many people are talking about leaving the village. There are some archival video clips from the days following the discovery of the girls' bodies. They show overhead shots of Blake's pit, close-ups of police officers searching the area, and contain interviews with the locals as they dropped their children off at school. One paper summarised the feeling among the villagers, saying, When Yolandi Waddington was murdered, the women were scared. Now they are terrified. 
both for themselves and also for their children. These murders seemed to hit closer to home. Yolande was almost a stranger to the village, but nearly everyone knew Jeanette and Jackie. There was a sense that, despite the tragedy and fear, for the kids, life should continue on as usual. The footage shows boys out on the school field playing cricket, while their head teacher John Hurd tells the cameras, everyone is stunned and shocked by the whole business, but our job is to try and restore some sanity to the whole picture, and this is what we're trying to do now, and what we have tried to do all day. In the same clip, one mother tells the reporter, it's such a horrible feeling. You're frightened to death to let the children out of your sight. You just feel numb all the time. Another is asked whether she thinks the deaths of Yolandi, Jeanette and Jacqueline are connected, and she says, I think so, yes. When asked if she feels it could be someone local, she hesitates, saying, it appears it might be. Later, the mother of the murderer tells the Reading Evening Post, It seems funny when I look back now, but on the day after the murder I was on television. I was one of the mothers taking their children to school, and they interviewed us, and I said that if any mother or wife was sheltering the murderer, she should give him up. That is what I said on television. I spend a while listening to this clip, trying to work out whether she is the third of the interviewed women. I think I detect the slight clip of a Yorkshire accent, mellowed by the years living down south, but I can't be sure. Despite what was to emerge in the coming months, then, on Tuesday the 18th of April, the day after the murders, the woman who spoke to the television crews had no idea that soon her son would be arrested for murder. While journalists flocked the village and surrounding areas, police began to get to work investigating the girls' deaths. It was 2am on the morning of the 18th of April when Professor Keith Simpson, the same Home Office pathologist who had been called in following the discovery of Yolandi's body, was tasked with examining Jeanette and Jacqueline at the Royal Berkshire Hospital in Reading. He discovered that Jeanette had been stabbed five times, reporting that there were two bruises just below the angle of her left lower jaw, which, in his opinion, indicated that either a hand was steadying her head as she was stabbed, or that someone had covered her mouth. Three of the stab wounds had been to her throat. The other two, more superficial cuts, were to her chest. Of her throat wounds, one, a two-inch deep slit, had punctured her jugular vein and carotid artery. This wound alone would have been fatal within a few minutes. He recorded her cause of death as shock and haemorrhage due to the stab wounds to her throat. The whole attack, he estimated, could have taken place in as few as seven to ten seconds. When it came to examining Jacqueline, she bore little in the way of external marks, only a slight flushing of the skin and a small bruise over the angle of her right jaw. These, he hypothesised, were signs that she had been seized by the throat and that suffocation had been attempted. He would later tell the court that, I think she would be likely to have lost consciousness as a result of this. Despite that, her cause of death was drowning, probably in the pool in which she was found. She bore no defensive wounds and there was no evidence that a struggle had taken place as she was killed. In the days following the murders, Detective Superintendent William Marchant of Scotland Yard was keen to stress that both girls were fully dressed when they were found and that there was no suggestion of sexual assault although it emerged later that, whether he was deliberately withholding findings or it was just that all the tests had not been completed, this wasn't entirely the case. Professor Simpson said there were no physical signs of a sexual assault on Jacqueline, but he elaborated 
that it did not mean from a medical point of view that there was not some kind of sexual assault upon her. Indeed, while he was examining the girls' bodies, Dr Brian Rees, a principal scientific officer at the Forensic Science Lab in Aldermaston, was preparing to examine their clothing and other items found at the scene. When he came to Jacqueline Williams' underwear, he found what was described as a large, diffused area of semen staining. Unfortunately, due to the fact that her body had been immersed in water, they were unable to identify a blood group. Later, he was tasked with examining swabs taken from Jacqueline herself, and on these, he also found traces of semen. There was no evidence that Jeanette had suffered any assault, and so the theory that emerged was that whatever had happened that day, it was Jacqueline who had been attacked first. At the trial, Kenneth Jones, QC, posited the following scenario. He had followed her into the copse. If it had been that she knew him, she might have made no attempt to run away or struggle. She was then sexually assaulted, something that would happen quickly and suddenly, as between a man and a child of nine. And then, turning to the girl Wigmore, Williams was assaulted, but Wigmore was not. There must have been some other reason why she met her death. It is a matter for you to decide, but if she had seen her friend's attacker, whether she had seen the attack, it matters not, and if she knew him, or if the attacker thought she knew him, it might be that she would have had to have been silenced, because she could have revealed the identity of the man who attacked her friend. In the days following the murders, Police blocked the access road leading down to the area where the gravel pits were, while searches were carried out. All the usual methods were deployed to help them catch the man responsible. House-to-house -house investigations began, and a mobile police headquarters was set up outside Beenham Village Hall, the same hall where, five months previously, the male residents had lined up to give blood in order to clear their names over Yolandi's murder. A questionnaire was prepared, to be answered by every person who lived in the village. Their replies would establish exactly where everyone had been between 5.30pm and 6.30 on Monday evening. When Yolandi Waddington had been killed, villagers were hesitant to help the police. But this time, with the two girls dead, they were keen to do whatever they could to help. Superintendent Marchant said that they were getting all the help that they needed. He told the news that we have a battalion of men searching the gravel pit, but no weapon has been found yet. Although there are more than a hundred police officers in the area, some drawn from regional crime squads in many parts of the country, we are doing a house-to-house -house investigation this afternoon. The response from the public has been quite good and we are sifting through a mine of information. Various people have been in touch about persons they have seen walking along the road near the pit, but nobody has been in touch to say that they have seen these girls after 5.30pm. In the area around Blake's Pit, frogmen crawled on hands and knees through shallow pools of water and mud, and police carried out an inch-by-inch -inch search of the area. They sifted through gravel around the old tin hut from which Tony Wigmore had spied his daughter's body, and special areas were cordoned off with string and markers. Officers in wellies and waders sifted through the swamps for the knife used to kill Jeanette. It was described as being a single-edged blade, about three-eighths of an inch to half an inch wide. In the footage I mentioned earlier, taken the day after the murders occurred, a policeman gently uncovers two bikes, laying discarded side by side on short grass. The front of the shot shows tall weeds just beginning to flower, and behind where the bikes lay are scrubby bushes, still no more than sticks after the cold of winter. From the overhead shot, you see how the pit banks are lined with trees leading down into the basin, half covered with grasses, but 
still with recognisable paths winding around them. When you look closely, you can catch the glint of water where pools of various sizes lay scattered randomly throughout. Scythes were used to cut down the swamp grass and the area was searched so thoroughly that by the time the investigation was completed, the pit, which had once been bursting with nature and life, was said by one local to have begun resembling a moonscape. Following appeals for anyone who might have seen either the girls or someone else in the area in the hour after 5.30pm, which had been identified as the probable window of death, witnesses began to come forward, claiming that they had seen several unknown cyclists in the area. Mr Ron Reed, who worked at the Mayridge site opposite, told the papers that on Monday afternoon, I noticed a man sitting on an iron gate about 400 yards from the pit where the girls were found. I was taking a load of gravel into Newbury, and when I came back about two hours later, he was still sitting there. That was quite late in the afternoon, and I couldn't help noticing him. He was sitting, looking across the fields. He had a bright blue racing cycle which looked new, I would say he would have been aged about 50 to 55. I could not see his face, but he had white hair and was wearing a sort of wind cheater. When I heard about the girls, I immediately thought of him. I have worked at the pit for about six years carrying gravel to Newbury seven times a day. I have never seen the man before, but I know all the farm workers and the local people around here. Another woman told of a man she'd seen about 400 yards away from the pit a few hours before the girls were killed. She said she spoke to him briefly as she passed by. Mrs Edie Goodall told of the man on the racing bike who she had spoken to as she walked home from Max Cafe on the A4 where she worked. She said he was sitting there on an iron gate and when I saw him I said good afternoon. He returned the greeting. I cannot really remember very much about him, but I would say he was aged about 50 and had a blue racing bike. It must have been about 3pm when I saw him. On Thursday the 20th of April, a blue overcoat and a pair of trousers, both heavily mud-stained, were found by a journalist as he walked in the woods close to the scene. The reporter said that the police seemed to think that the clothes could be important. They were covered with mud and looked as if they had been in muddy water and had dried out in the sun. They were the sort of clothes that a teenager would wear. Police at this point were working on the assumption that whoever the killer was, he must have gotten himself relatively mud and water stained, and perhaps even bloody after carrying out the attacks. As the week rolled on, there was no sign of the press letting up their coverage of the murders. In flowery prose not normally found in newspaper columns, the Reading Evening Post spoke of the sun setting over the trees that bordered the deserted farmhouses east of Webb's Lane. He described how a policeman stands guard at the entrance to the pit and above him hangs a deep, deep red sky. He talks of a tension in the air, the writer, speaking through a lens of sexism, says that while he expected hysteria from the women of the village, they have approached the murders with a common sense born to mothers. He goes to the Six Bells and talks with the punters there. They tell him how they remember Superintendent Wallace Virgo standing at the bar not long before the investigation into Yolandi's murder was wound down. One of the regulars, Cecil, says he told me before he left that it would happen again. He stood at this very bar and said the next victim would be either a child or an old woman. The Six Bells was proving to be something of a hub for journalists, police and locals alike. It was a place where people didn't mind talking after they'd had a pint or two. A day later, two young men were interviewed in the bar there. One of them, David Burgess, who lived on the Stonyfields council estate, said, 
There were four policemen at my house last night. They asked me where I was last Monday night and I told them I was working until 7pm at the Mayridge excavation site, opposite the gravel pit. While I was at the pits, I slipped in to see if I had caught a rabbit in a trap I had set as I do a bit of rabbiting around the village. I was interviewed by police last year after the Yolandi Waddington murder. I told them I had lost a knife, which was similar to the one that was used to stab Yolandi Waddington. Peg, the barmaid at the Six Bells, said, It's so close to home. And a farm labourer, when asked how he felt about the fact that there may be a killer in their midst, replied, You never think of it that way. While initially the mass blood testing, which had taken place after Yolandi's death, had solidified the residents' idea that the killer was not a local, the murders of Jeanette and Jacqueline made them rethink their complacency. One villager said, I'm willing to bet the killer is a local man. As far as I am concerned, the blood tests did not eliminate the village from suspicion. Who is to say that it's not a man over 50 or a couple of young louts? Despite this, there was still nothing concrete to link anyone local to the killings, and the papers were full of talks of unknown cyclists, a car driver seen close by, a Ford Zodiac or Zephyr, which was spotted at around 8.30 the evening of the murders by a Mr Bradfield. Mr Bradfield was one of the men who was called out by Tony Wigmore following the discovery of his daughter's body, and he said, The man must have been doing something under the dashboard, and he glanced up as Mr Wigmore and I ran down the road. It must have been about 8.30pm, and I could see him well. He was a smallish man, aged about 20 to 25, and had high cheekbones. His hair was curly and mouse-coloured. There was also a bird watcher who police thought might be a witness. She was eventually identified as Mrs Evelyn Trembath, who said, I use the road to get from Bath Road to Pangbourne. It's so much quieter. I'm interested in birds and I stopped off by the pits to look through my binoculars, though I did not look into the pit where the girls were found. The place was deserted, and as I had no idea of the time, I was unable to help the police. I wouldn't have known that anything had happened there. As the days rolled on, potential suspects, all strangers to the village, were identified and eliminated one by one, and, in a pattern that I see time and time again throughout my research, Despite the early enthusiasm of reporters, eventually the newspapers started to run out of things to say. Despite the fact that Beenham itself was still being regularly inundated by what was described as morbid sightseers, who would motor slowly through the village intent on seeing for themselves where the murders had been committed, in the press, articles on the killings were getting shorter and shorter. The information was no longer fresh, and so what was being published became no more than rehashes of previous columns. On the 29th of April, 12 days after the girls' deaths, newspaper interest was briefly reignited when it was reported that Jeanette's grandmother was being flown back to England from Melbourne, where she had been living for the past 13 months. The flight, which would cost £800, was being funded by the Metropolitan Police Widows Fund. Marion Wigmore's father had been a policeman until his death in the Second World War. Speaking about Marion, her brother Kenneth said, She told me the other day that she cannot see the point of living. This has shattered her, and she needs her mother badly. Florence Slack. Jeanette's grandmother said, It's wonderful to be able to go back to Marion. I shall try and persuade her and her husband Tony to come back to Australia with me. Florence arrived back in the UK on the 3rd of May to be greeted by the press and waiting police. Escorted from Heathrow Airport in a car manned by special branch detectives, she was overcome with emotion and too distressed to talk to the gathering reporters. 
this is the point where if I were covering an unsolved case, information would have become scant, but here, just as it looked, according to the papers, as if police might be all out of options, on Friday the 5th of May 1967, a little shy of three weeks after the girls were killed, suddenly a short article appeared saying that forensic tests were being carried out by scientists at Aldermaston, and that it was expected that these tests would lead to an arrest within the next four days. Three days later, at midday on Monday the 8th, a 19-year-old man was brought into Bradfield and Sonning Magistrates Court in Reading. He wore a green combat jacket, blue jeans with brown suede shoes and stood handcuffed between two police officers. 30 workmen and 20 pressmen filed into the open court to hear him be charged with the murder of Jeanette Wigmore, with Jacqueline's to follow before the month was out. Across the road, women crowded the windows of office blocks, looking to catch a glimpse of what was occurring inside. So rushed were the preparations that, as Superintendent Arthur Lawson took the stand, a Bible had to be fetched so that he could take the oath. He told the court, At 8.50am yesterday, Sunday, May the 7th, together with Superintendent Marchant, I saw David Burgess at Newbury Police Station. At 9.25, I told him he would be detained and charged with murder. He said, Well, this is that, then. At 11.40am, I cautioned and charged him. He swore, saying, I never killed her. But... What had brought police's attention to dumper driver David Burgess, who worked at Mayridge Pitts, a man who had lived in the village of Beenham his entire life? I'm afraid you'll have to wait until next time to find out. I had intended this to be in two parts, but when my research for this episode ran to 30 pages, I knew I'd miscalculated somewhat. Don't worry, I'll uh, be leaving slightly less of a gap between this one and the next, so make sure to watch out for that in your podcast feeds. And if you can't wait, I'll be releasing this and the next part simultaneously on Patreon. I hope you're enjoying the episode so far, and if you like what you hear, please consider heading over to www.patreon.com forward slash the outlines podcast to support the show. The link is in the description box below, as always. Thank you to my latest supporters, including Jen De Rose Pushkal. It's very much appreciated. This episode of Outlines was researched, written, performed and produced by Jess Carter. The music was composed by Elias Hardy.